I remind us all, because we make fun of the art of politics, that we human beings were made to live under law, and we must live that way. And that is why, why it is right for Calvin Coolidge to have said that statesmen are the ambassadors of providence sent to reveal to us our unknown selves. You'll never get to meet many. Nikki Haley is a stateswoman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Whew, that was scary. <laughs> I didn't know what he was going to say. It is an absolute pleasure to be here with you today. I thank you. It is an honor. I will tell you, I've heard so many things around the country about Hillsdale College. But your biggest cheerleaders, and the reason that I am here, is because of Bill and Jan Broadbeck. They are tremendous friends. They are great supporters of Hillsdale, and I thank you for your support. So I know Dr. Arn told you a little bit about my story. I'm going to tell you a little bit more because it tells, one, why we're here. It tells where we're going, and it tells what we can do from there. Yes, I will always say I am the proud daughter of Indian parents that reminded us every day how blessed we were to live in this country. They loved the fact that you could come to this country, make anything you wanted, be as successful as you wanted to be, and nothing was going to get in your way. I did start doing the books for them when I was 13. It wasn't until I got to Clemson that I realized that wasn't normal. But what they were teaching me then was they didn't want me to know differences. They didn't want me to know difference in gender. They didn't want me to know differences in race. They didn't want me to know the differences in challenges that hold you back. And so as I moved forward and went on to Clemson and graduated in accounting and worked for a corporation, I came back home to the family business. And the one thing we consistently saw in our family business was how hard it was to make a dollar and how easy it was for government to take it. I got incredibly frustrated. My mom always said, don't complain about it, do something about it. And so I decided to run for the state house. I had never been politically active and did not know you weren't supposed to run against an incumbent in a primary. I ended up defeating a, the longest serving legislator in a Republican primary and moved on to the state house and quickly realized that I had defeated the legislature's friend. It was a Republican House and a Republican Senate. And I met another person, Nathan Ballantyne, who had defeated the majority leader that year. They were both considered coincidences. Couldn't have possibly been true. They were just kind of acts that weren't supposed to happen. But what we did know was real was the fact that no one wanted to share a desk with us. No one wanted to share an office with us. So we became desk mates and suite mates and quickly realized that we were part of a new group. We were the conservatives. We were the reformers. And what we were trying to do was change the way that government worked. And so as we moved forward, we started what we found out was a movement in South Carolina. Because the year it was just the two of us. But every year after that, we started to add more to the mix. It was starting to not be about being Republican. It was about being conservative. And so every term mattered and more and more came. And so as we grew this movement, something else came to mind. You started to notice other problems within the state. In the state of South Carolina, legislators were not um, required to show their votes on the record. And it seemed like normal habit because it was what they had always done. But it came to light one day when they voted themselves an increase in their pensions and they passed it on a voice vote. Yet to this day, you cannot find one legislator that said they voted themselves a pay raise. I got very upset. I went to my Republican leadership and I said, we are Republicans. This is embarrassing. Why did we do this? And the next day I filed a bill that said anything important enough to be debated on the floor of the House or the Senate is important enough for you to know how your legislator voted. My Republican leadership told me, put the bill away. We don't need to have it we will decide what the public needs to see and what they don't. I knew that I had a mission. I knew that I needed to fight the fight. And so I went around the state and I said, did you know of all the votes taken in the South Carolina House, 
only 8% were on the record. Did you know of all the votes taken in the South Carolina Senate, only 1% was on the record? And if you didn't know how your House member voted 92% of the time, if you didn't know how your senator voted 99% of the time, how'd you know how to vote when you went to the polls? The people were shocked. To put all of this into perspective, my first year in office, I was chairman of the freshman class. My second year, I was majority whip. My third year, I was put on a powerful business committee. And my fourth year, I was subcommittee chair of banking. The year that I wouldn't put the bill away, the year that I wouldn't stop talking around my state about the lack of accountability. My leadership basically pulled all of my ranks away. I lost everything. I was no longer majority whip, no longer chairman, no longer on the banking committee. They pulled everything. I realized at that point I had no pull. I had no clout. I had no ability to move anything in the state legislature anymore. So I ran for governor. I ran for governor with no name ID. I ran for governor with absolutely no money. But what I did have was I had grassroots. I had a conservative message and I had passion. And we went around the state and we talked about the things we cared about. And in the first year, it all paid off because now in the state of South Carolina, every single legislator has to show their vote on the record. Not only do they have to show their vote on the record, they have to show their vote on every section of the budget. So we actually get to see the spending habits of our legislators. We also passed illegal immigration reform. We also passed Medicaid reform. And we said that if you have to show a picture ID to buy Sudafed, if you have to show picture ID to get on a plane, you should have to show a picture ID to vote to protect the one integrity we have in the state. And just to make sure that everything continued to go our way, I did a Haley report card on all the legislature. So every issue that I cared about, we told them what the issue was, we told them how we wanted them to vote, and we just went around and did a series of town halls and gave them all grades. And if they were good to us and they did the right things, these were not partisan, this was pro-business, this was good government, this was tort reform, this was illegal, this was restructuring, this was making sure legislators voted on the record. We went and showed their votes to all of their constituents. And we said, if they did the right thing, praise them for it, because it's not easy. They go up against a lot of pressure. They go up against leadership, but praise them. If they did the wrong thing, use this as a conversation piece. Use it at the ballot box and ask them why they weren't for it. So now our focus in South Carolina is jobs, jobs in the economy. It's the number one focus that most states have. And so when we look in South Carolina, and as we look across the country, what is it that we're looking for when we're trying to bring jobs into our state? South Carolina is doing great when it comes to bringing jobs. But the reason we're doing great is because we're keeping the cost of business low. We just passed tort reform this year. We were the only state in the Southeast that didn't have caps. We now have caps on frivolous lawsuits and have completely made us competitive on that front. We knew that permits mattered, and so when it came to our Health and Environmental Control Board, I wiped the entire board clean, and now the chairman of my DHEC board is the president of a construction company. <laughs> they understand in state government that time is money, and if an agency is costing a company time, they are costing them money, and so we no longer allow that. The second thing is we have a great trained workforce in South Carolina, because people are your assets, and you've got to make sure that that happens. And then the one that I continue to be the most proud of, we have one of the lowest union participation rates in the country. <laughs> And it's paying off because just in the past six weeks, Bridgestone announced their largest investment in North America in a small town in South Carolina, $1.2 billion, 850 jobs. Two weeks later, Continental Tire came in and announced another $500 million investment, 1,700 jobs in the small town of Sumter, South Carolina. Today, we announced Nephron Pharmaceuticals. They announced that they were investing 313 million, 700 jobs. We have gone, in just since January, since I've taken office, almost announced 16,000 jobs in the state of South Carolina since January.
We build planes, we build cars, we build tires, and now today I've been saying we make drugs, but I have to say we make medicine in the state of South Carolina, and we're proud to say that we do that. So everything is continuing to go well, but one, I am trying to continue to change what I think is very important. It's not about having a Republican House and a Republican Senate. It's about having a conservative House and a conservative Senate. That's when we start to move things. And what we did last year was the unthinkable. And I want you to think about this. The state of South Carolina elected a 38-year-old female Indian to be governor. <laughs> How far have we come? So we're doing great in South Carolina. But I'm going to be honest with you. I'm worried for our country. We're seeing debt and deficits that we never thought we would see. We're seeing mandated health care that will bankrupt our states. We're seeing enormous stimulus spending that has not done anything but raised unemployment and continued to give us a loss of a credit rating. And we've seen things that we never thought would happen in, in our country. And I'll give you one example because it's an example in South Carolina. The president said not too long ago that he wanted to see things made in America. And my answer to him was, I've got some great American planes in Charleston, South Carolina that we're trying to make and you're holding us back from doing that. We have a great American company called Boeing. And I know, absolutely applaud for them because they're a great company. Thank you. I know many of you have heard the story, but I'm going to repeat it over and over again. And I'm going to ask you to repeat it until every household in America talks about it. Boeing came to Charleston, South Carolina and created a thousand jobs at a time that our state needed it. At the same time, they expanded 2,000 jobs in Washington state. Not one person was hurt, not one. Yet the NLRB comes in and sues them. It's the most un-American thing I've ever seen and it has to stop. Now the, the good thing I will tell you is that Boeing and I have a pact. We know that they can't settle because they understand they're fighting on behalf of every company in this country. I'm fighting on behalf of every governor in this country. And what I will tell you tonight is between me and Boeing, we will win. We will beat the NLRB. But let's think back a little bit. Think back to the 1930s. We had an economic crisis that was much worse than this. It was worldwide. We had 25% unemployment. And our response, not as extreme as other countries, but it was a massive government intervention. President Roosevelt's New Deal changed the way people saw our government. They changed the way they thought about it. People were suffering, and the private sector was viewed to have failed. So the American people went to their government for help. These government interventions that we now know as Social Security, Child labor laws, minimum wage laws have now become part of the fabric of America. But 75 years later, there's a problem. The growth never stopped. We never stopped growing. The modern welfare state has bred debt, dependency, and economic stagnation. In exchange for promises of comfort and security, we've surrendered our freedom to government. But the one thing that concerns me is we've lost the don't complain about it, do something about it that my parents taught me as I was growing up. You always had a solution. You always did something about it. And now we have a president whose response is to do the exact same thing, a massive government intervention. But the difference is we already have that. We've already done that. It didn't work. So as we go forward, the great part I can tell you is that there is hope because the people don't want it anymore. They now realize that government is not the answer. It's the problem. And the hope that I have is that I have faith in the American people. I know that they understand that government's time is gone. The private sector's time has begun. And that the best lessons are when we go through the burn. And when we go through this burn, our number one goal is to make sure we never get back to this situation again. We need people to know the power of their voice. We need them to be loud about it. It is no longer about elected officials telling us what to do. We now need to tell elected officials what we expect them to do. Thank you. 
We can turn things around. I know that we can. I know that my parents had faith in this country. I know that I will always have faith in this country. But I will tell you, the movement has begun. So our little movement in the South Carolina State House that started with me and a representative named Nathan Ballantyne may have started in South Carolina, but it's now going across the country. We have to support it. We have to strengthen it. We have to have faith and know that this country was meant for great things. Thank you very, very much. God bless you. God bless America. Thank you. Thank you very much. And so now the real fun begins because I hear we get to do some Q&A, which I love. So it's all about what you want to talk about. Um, I think we've got a couple of people in the room that have microphones. Am I right about that? And so who wants to ask the first question? Oh, there we go. The leadership that you've exhibited for the state of South Carolina and this nation, and may God continue to bless you. My question is twofold. First, the situation with Boeing and the National Labor Relations Board. What type of an economic impact has this had so far in South Carolina, and what do you foresee in the future for other right-to-work states? Thank you. Thank you. You know, the interesting thing is this is not just affecting right-to-work states. This is actually more harmful for non-right-to-work states because what company is ever going to want to go to a state that's, that's not right-to-work? Um, we are not seeing any economic impact. We are pushing forward. We have planes in production. It is a beautiful plant, and I'm ready for those Mac Daddy planes to come out of there, and they will. What I will tell you has been a little bit interesting is the unions have gotten a little bit upset with me and sued me and told me to quit talking negatively about them. And I said, well, when you quit giving me reasons to talk negatively about you, I'll quit talking smack. Um, I will tell you that the conservative judges, God bless them, it's the reason we need them, turned around and ruled the case down and said it was freedom of speech and I had the right to say whatever I wanted. Next question. I said, I would like you to tell me what we can do for our great governor of the state of Georgia, Governor Deal, whom I love and I work to elect, as I did you. But you stand against federal intervention. You stand against them handing you dollars so you can match their dollars so you, they can leave South Carolina and you holding the bag. So I want to know what we can do in Georgia to nudge our wonderful governor to stand in the right way for this T-SPLOS, for this ARC, for this rapid rail that we're doing here in the state of Georgia because it's going to leave us holding the debt. You know, the interesting thing that we want to remind every governor in the country, and we need to remind ourselves, is government was intended to secure the rights and freedoms of the people. It was never intended to be all things to all people. When you think of it that way, what we have done with our agencies is we've gone through, and I've asked every one of my cabinet agencies to define their core mission of government and let me know how many federal dollars they're taking. If those federal dollars don't line up with that core mission, we don't want it anymore. And in most cases, you will see, and we just turned down some stimulus money for education in South Carolina. You can't use one-time money for reoccurring expenses. Every business can tell you that. It's the standard rule when you're running a business. The second thing is there is not a federal dollar you can take where they don't have a requirement attached to it. It forces you to do things you wouldn't normally do. States will learn that when they realize that our budgets are getting tougher. We do have to balance our budgets. Thank God I can't wait till Washington has to do that, and we have to make them do that. Um, but we have to balance our budgets, and we have to prioritize. And what I told the people in South Carolina during the state of the state was I said this year is going to hurt. But if you stay with me, I will make sure we never have to go through this again. That's the decisions governors have to make. It's not fun. In South Carolina, I vetoed the Arts Commission got everybody upset. But arts is not what government was intended to pay for. Not when... <laughs> S 
70% of the Arts Commission was salaries. I said, we wouldn't give a charity that money. You know, why in the world would you give it in government? I vetoed education television. In a time of internet and everything else, why are we funding ETV? Instead of me giving them 10 plus million dollars, just because, I said, we're gonna do a bill for service. If you do a bill for my agency, they will pay you. But the private sector gets to play a role in this too. And if we decide to go with someone else, we'll pay them. That's how we have to think about government. We do it in our businesses every day. Government should not be exempt. So what I will tell you is encourage Governor Deal when he does the right thing and encourage him to also realize federal dollars continue to be just a pull on us. They really are. And with Washington being in chaos, I can't get us independent enough from them because I don't want that to be what leads our state. I want us to be independent and healthy and happy. And you're seeing that with the businesses we're bringing. And you're seeing that with our budgets. We started with an $800 million shortfall. We ended up with a surplus. It's because we made good decisions. Every governor will see that over time. We're going to be forced to. My question is, how do you win the next generation uh, with conservative ideals? The left has always had sort of a machine, I shouldn't say always, has had a machi machine in academia. But how does the right respond? I mean, it, it's really interesting. I'm a young guy, and we took note of the fact that student loan debt cleared credit card debt, both the kinds of debt that my generation struggles with. Mm -hmm. How do you convince a generation that didn't go through a depression, that didn't go through a world war, that didn't even really go through the Cold War, that these realities that lessons from history have shown us matter now, and that conservatism is really the way to go? And the thing is, I think that we have talked at people, but we haven't talked to them. And the one thing that will move people every day is when you talk about their wallet and you talk about their homes, and you talk about their liberties, and you talk about their freedoms, and just talk to them. I've always told, and I tell my staff, we always speak on an eighth grade level. People shouldn't have to struggle to understand you. They should get it. I just spoke to a big group of uh, business students at the College of Charleston, and we had some Occupy Wall Street people there, and we had everybody else, but there wasn't a person in that room that didn't understand where I was coming from. And it's because I told them when they left college, I wanted them to get a job. And when they got that job, I wanted them to keep more money in their pocket than I did have them give it to government. And I told them I wanted them to have more freedom and liberties than before so that they could make the decisions for their families. And I told them that I wanted them to understand that when they were successful, we were going to reward them for being successful. We weren't going to take it from them and give it to someone else. They get that. They get that. And for anybody that thinks that college students are too young to understand, my 13-year-old daughter got it because she heard on the news, she heard them talking about class warfare. And she said, what is that? Are they fighting in class? <laughs> and I said, no. I said, this is what it's about. Just imagine if you studied for a test and you studied really hard and you made an A and the person next to you made a D. And because they thought that you made an A and they made a D, they just didn't think it was fair, so they gave you a C. Her first comment was, that's not fair, I earned that. And I said, that's class warfare. So if a 13-year-old can understand it, anybody can understand it. Any other questions? Hello, thank you for being here tonight. My pleasure. Very inspirational. Thank you. Um, I was just curious, have you named or a back to candidate uh, any of the Republican candidates for presidency? I knew that was going to come up. <laughs> this is what I will tell you. Um, will I endorse? Yes, I will endorse. And, but I will endorse, and I will ask you not to endorse. We no longer should elect someone because they look good in a picture or hold a baby well. If, th <laughs> if they're not going to fight for us, if they're not going to give us the details and show results and really tell what they're about, that's not who we want. We need a courageous leader. When you see me endorse, it will be me endorsing as a governor. 
What as a governor am I looking for in a president? Because I can tell you right now, we need a president that understands that our Medicaid costs are going up and we need block grants. We need as much flexibility as we can. I as a governor need to know that a president, when they see that I've got an issue, they understand they've got to call me back. We had an illegal immigration issue and I called the Homeland Security Office and my director did too. They wouldn't call us back for three months. I had two dozen illegal immigration inspectors sitting at their desk unable to do their work. The way I got President Obama's administration to call me back was I had a press conference. Within a week, I solved it and it was done. I shouldn't have to have that happen to do that. But we need to ask the hard decisions. I have not decided. I can tell you in South Carolina, it's anyone's game. Anyone that says that there's a number one person there, it's just not true. The best thing that happened was we closed the field. You know, everybody was waiting for that new person, that new person. You know, the field is closed. It is what it is. What I will tell you is, shame on us if this is not a one-term president. Because with the high unemployment, with the credit rating dropped, with the economy the way it is, the ammunition is there. It's whether we're smart enough to be as strong enough, have the grassroots, the conservative message, and the passion to make it happen. South Carolina, like my home state of New Mexico, has historically struggled in K through 12 education. What are you doing to reform that particular area of the state? You know, education is an interesting thing in every state, and what we always have to remember is that's our future workforce. That, at the end of the day, is what we have to focus on. What we're going to focus on in South Carolina is reforming our funding formula. Right now in our state and in a lot of states, we fund children based on property tax base. It's wrong. We have to fund them on the fact that that is our future workforce and they deserve a good education. So we are going to start putting dollars on the child, but we're going to hold our school districts accountable. They now have to show measurables, graduation rates, dollars in the classroom. What are they doing to help in challenged areas? There's going to be several measurables that they've got to do to show what they're doing to live up to that. In turn, we will give them the funding, but we'll give it flexibility because every county is not the same. Some go through different challenges. Some may need technology. Some may need smaller classrooms. But whatever it is, we need to give them the flexibility to do that. When you do that, what you do is the school districts that do well, they get more money. The school districts that are challenged, not living up to those measurables, are incentivized to want to do better. And you have to go to merit-based pay for teachers. But understand, absolutely, understand that merit-based pay for teachers doesn't come from the state level. It comes from the principal and the school that sees that teacher every day and watches what that teacher does. The problem we have with education is we've got great teachers, but, but our teachers now have to be the parent and the pastor and the guidance counselor and everything else. Oh, and by the way, they have to teach to a test. It's wrong. We need to untie their hands and let teachers do what they do best, which is just teach our kids. Governor Haley. Yes. I'm a tea partier in South Carolina. God bless you, and, and I love you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Early on, we tea partiers learned two things. Uh, rallies wouldn't do it. We found out that we needed power. The other thing we found out was we didn't have any. Politics is about power. That's the purpose of it. You gave us a great gift whenever you gave us the requirement that votes be recorded. Recorded votes are the foundational gateway to the republic. And you gave us that, and you gave us our power. I wanted to thank you for that. Thank you very much. Governor Haley, I've been hearing on the news about um, a possibility of a third party candidate. What can we do about that? I mean, that, that worries me sort of more than anything right now. You know, I know that everyone's talking about a third party candidate, and I think that we need to remember to stay focused and stay on message. Primaries 
are great for a reason, because we debate and we try and find out who is the best to represent our party. And so initially you have some that say, well, I could never vote for that person. I could never vote for that person. It's going to happen. It happened with my race. It happens in every race. The goal is that we have to understand that we have to have a one-term president. Don't worry about the third party candidate. It's not going to happen because all of our independents, all of our Tea Parties, all of our GOPs understand that anything right now is better than what we've got. I think. How do you deal with public employee unions? Well, let's first start with how I deal with unions in general. Um, I think they are so desperately trying to be relevant, God bless them, and they're just not. Um, <laughs> there was a time and place where I think they mattered, and there is, this is not that time. What I can tell you that I am so proud of in South Carolina is if you took a union and you put them in Boeing or you put them in BMW or you put them in Michelin, the employees would tell them to walk out. And the reason is our employers in South Carolina understand they are not anything without the people that take care of them. And so they have a direct relationship with their employees, and the employees love that. In terms with the public unions, I mean, I think in general, even in South Carolina, we're starting to see a little bit of a distaste because they want to have – this is all about communication. That's what unions are. Unions are all about trying to take away that communication, trying to be that voice that talks for everybody. But that's the opposite of what people want today. People want to be able to speak for themselves. They don't want a middleman in there talking for them. And in South Carolina, what we do is if there's a company that has a threat of a union, we walk in there and we say, I'm just here to let you know how much your employer appreciates you. All they do is talk about how they wouldn't be able to do this without you. And we go and we talk about that to companies all over our state. And we need to talk about that across our country. You don't have a union problem unless you have conflict. The unions are trying to create conflict. When you look at Occupy Wall Street, look at who's funding it. Those are your unions. Your unions are trying to create a distraction. I mean, you've got people in Occupy Wall Street, and they're holding up signs saying, I'm mad too. You know, honk if you're for liberty. There's no rhyme or reason to what they're trying to do. But the only rhyme and reason that we do have is that the unions are funding their offices. The unions are funding their lodging. The unions are feeding them. And they're sending them to different states to do that. We have to continue to spread the word. In terms of the public unions, it's about communication. It will continue to be about communication. We are dealing with a pension issue in South Carolina. And we're going to continue to talk to our state employees and let them know what the situation is and let them be at the table. And we think that we'll be able to handle that. Any other questions? Uh, two questions here. Number one, when you are faced with a revenue shortfall, how do you decide which programs to cut? And secondly, do you think we face a crisis in the definition of personal responsibility? I know you do. And how do we deal properly with it? I think the first thing that every governor needs to do, I think it's the one thing that I pray every day that Washington will do, is go back to that understanding of you can't be all things to all people. You know, I did not make people happy when we went against the Arts Commission. I didn't make people happy when we went against education television. What I did say was, this is about making the hard decisions. And this is about looking at what really do we want to be paying for and what do we want to send to the private sector. For me, it's things like, we have a thousand people working in the Department of Education right now. Half of them work in school bus maintenance. That's not where we need to be putting money when it comes to education. So we're pushing to privatize our school buses, so that's not an issue. You look for the faults in the system, and then you go to your agencies, and you reward and incentivize them for actually doing better, for saving money, for becoming more efficient. And remember what those core functions of government were. It's health care. It's education. It's safety. It's not anything more than that. What you find is special interest groups want to be a part of that core mission. Our goal as governors is to be loud and say, but that's not, a, that's not the role of government. That's not the core mission. So it takes a lot of courage to do it. And then it takes a lot of education to let people know why you did it. 
And then if you do that, you will see a difference. What I will also tell you that every state is going to start to see. So we're going to start to see our revenues pop back up. We've, we're kind of starting to breathe. We're starting to see things get a little bit better. The number one goal in every state and should eventually be in Washington are spending caps. We've got to live by spending caps. We do it at home. We do it in our businesses. Government can't be exempt from that. When you look at those spending caps and additional money falls, the only uses for that additional money is either to pay down debt or give it back to the people that paid it in. That's the conversation we're having in South Carolina right now. The personal responsibility side goes back to, you know, hand up or a handout. And this is creating the conversation that, you know, our unemployment situation, the way we're moving it in South Carolina, I'm going to make it so uncomfortable for somebody to sit on the couch. It's just not the way we're going to have it in South Carolina. But I'm going to incentivize them to want to get trained. I'm going to incentivize them to want to have training so that they get a better job. That's the way we do it, is we let them know that actually personal responsibility of doing for yourself and taking care of yourself is so much more rewarding than sitting on a couch and allowing someone else to take care of you. It takes a little bit more muscle, but we can do it. And it takes a lot of creativity. And you have to let everybody else think it was their idea. But when you do that, great things can happen. Is that everybody? There's two, three more back there in the back. Uh, there's a consensus that um, the education system in the country needs to get fixed. And most people, well, pretty much everybody hopes that that happens. But what do you think the consequences will be if our education system doesn't get fixed and, and the country gets more serious about education in the near future? The best thing that could happen for education in our country is for every state to be able to take care of it themselves. I mean, that's the number one thing is South Carolina is not like Georgia. Georgia's not like Texas. Texas isn't like California. We all have different educational needs. And the federal government has to understand that them dictating from Washington is just like health care. You can't go and say what kind of health care we need for our state and tell us how we need to educate our children. you got to release those strings. And that's a lot of what needs to happen. The solutions that we need to federal mandates is going to fall on our governors. Our governors have to step up. We have to show how it's hurting our states. We have to show how it's hurting our budgets. You're going to see me get very involved in pulling governors together because you put four or five governors at a podium and the world watches because governors have nothing to gain but just helping their state. And so that's what I'm hoping we can have, have happen is I did that with the NLRB. We got all governors, all Republican governors together to say this was wrong. And then we also asked all presidential candidates to speak on it. And it happened. We're going to try and do the same thing when it comes to Medicaid and block granting. We're going to try and do the same thing with education. If we can create the conversation for the federal government to understand that their constituents need flexibility, their constituents need to have their hands untied from the federal government, that's going to be the answer. Education will be an issue because we've got training issues. We've got international companies that for the first time in a long time are looking to invest in the United States because the dollar is weak. We need to seize that. We need to make sure that we take hold of that opportunity and take those investment dollars, allow those companies to come. But if we don't have the workforce, none of that's going to matter. So we've got to look at education. I think we'll be forced to do that. If for some chance that our current president wins a second term, will you consider running in 2016? He's not going to win. That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> I think that was it. Well, listen, you have honored me. Thank you so very much. It's been a true pleasure. God bless you.